Hello, good evening. Uh, welcome everybody to this evening's Facebook Live. Uh, my name is Alec. I'm the Managing Director for Wound Care People. Uh, tonight's session is a personalized approach to, sh uh, to shared self-care for people with venous leg ulcers. And our speaker this evening is uh, Dr. Leanne Atkin. Leanne, how are you? Good evening. I'm very well, Alec. How are you? Yeah, very good. It's been a while since we've done one of these together. It's good to see it you is. again. It is indeed. Excellent. And uh, so, Leanne, you're a, a lecturer practitioner at the University of Huddersfield, vascular nurse consultant at Mid York's NHS Trust. Have we got that right? Indeed, you have. Yeah. Brilliant. OK, so for all of you watching at home, uh, tonight's session is sponsored by um, LNR. So I'd just like to thank our colleagues over at, uh, at LNR for all of the, um, the support that they've, uh, they've given us uh, and also the support they continue to provide to healthcare professionals across the UK. Um, in providing this real vital education. So thank you very much to Team LNR. Um, as always, certificates will be available at the end. Uh, do bear with us if there's any technical issues. You can see that we're presenting uh, at, uh, from our homes at the moment. There shouldn't be any problems though, however. Um, the way this is gonna work as usual, Leanne's gonna do the presentation. You want to ask as many questions as you possibly can during the, uh, during the presentation in the chat box. Um, some of my colleagues are there to answer questions directly. Um, but we'll be taking uh, notes of all of those that get uh, come through, and then we'll be doing a, uh, a live Q&A at the end of the presentation. Um, I think that's it for now for me, Leanne. I think that's uh, most of the housekeeping. All I'll say is uh, for those of you watching, do uh, do engage with us. Uh, it makes for a better um, makes for a better presentation. It makes for a better event. Um, let us know where you're watching from, as in where in the country, which trust you are, and what type of uh, what type of job role you have, because we always find that. Really interesting to make sure that we're aiming these at the right people. Um, Leanne, I'm going to hand over to you and uh, I'll see you after the presentation for the live Q&A. Thank you. So good evening, everybody. Uh, yeah, my name's Leanne. I'm a doctor, but by PhD, I'm a nurse in my heart and I've been a nurse now for over 30 years. And I would call myself a very passionate lower limb clinician. And I am still down and dirty. We have just today come out of a fully overbooked double clinic and um, so I, I am still there with you if you like on the call front of what you're facing. So today's session is really going to be focusing on the personalised approach to encouraging patients to self-care especially those patients with venous leg ulceration. And um, what we're wanting to do today is for you to really um, understand why personalised shared care is so important especially thinking about those wider NHS pressures that we're all living under. How a venous leg ulcer develops, we're going to give you a little bit of insight to the anatomy and physiology, what is venous hypertension and why does that wound occur? And that's going to be really linked back to why it's important to have that timely assessment, that accurate diagnosis and the use of those evidence-based treatment plans. We're going to be talking about how we actually enable our patients to undertake self-care and what's the benefits of that, both to you as a clinician and to them as a patient. Um, and at the end of this, we're just going to give you a little bit of a challenge, really, a, a bit of a call to action just for you to challenge your own mindset and start to do things slightly different. And, and why do we think that call of action is needed? Well, there is an escalating burden of wounds. We're calling this a, a wound care crisis, if you like. And that's not just an inflammatory headline. It's actually based on significant data. These are all the statistics that you can see on this slide about the state of play. We have around 1 million patients with an active wound at this moment in time. That's about 2% of the adult population. We're spending around £3.1 billion each and every year on the management of these patients. Around 50% of community nursing time is now taken up by wound care. But the worrying data sets for all of this is that since 2012 to 2017, there's been a 71% increase on the number of wounds that we are treating within the NHS. And I just want to you to think about in that period, in that last 10 years time frame, we've had a 71% increase on our demands for our activity. How much has your staffing increased during that time to be able to cope with that demand? And I say that with a slight snigger because I can imagine your 
establishment for your nursing has not increased by 1%, never mind by 71%. So we've been asked to do more um, with the same amount of resources, and that provides a huge challenge. But I think the saddest statistic of all of this is that we have recurrence rates of up to 69% in the first year. So if you've healed a patient with a venous leg ulcer, 69, 70% of those patients will reoccur within that first 12 month time frame. And I think that's really sad. And I also think it sort of puts you in the mindset of what's the point of healing these patients that 70% of them are gonna reoccur anyway. And actually, that reoccurrence rate is so high because of lack of evidence-based care. And hopefully by the end of today, we're going to all work together to try to move those statistics in the right direction. The first part of this is for you to change your mindset. I want you to stop thinking of that leg ulcer as a leg ulcer. I want you to see it as a weed. And I love this phrase. You may have heard me say it before because actually what you're seeing is just the wound, it's the head of the dandelion, if you like. You wouldn't go into your garden and just chop off the head of the dandelion and expect it not to come back. But actually, the roots within the venous leg ulcer is within that venous system. You can see on that picture, that big varicosity that's feeding that ulcer, that's causing that chronic venous hypertension and is causing that wound on the leg. So to be able to treat that effectively, we need to target our treatments at reducing the venous hypertension and tackling those roots. I think that it's really important for you to understand the dynamics between the veins, the arteries and the capillary. And within venous hypertension, what you do is you get a back pressure, a higher abnormal pressure within that blue venous system. That actually increases the pressure that's being put onto that capillary bed. And you can see that capillary bed is an absolute delicate structure of where the gaseous exchange takes place, the oxygenated blood comes in, gets used up by the cells and comes out as deoxygenated blood. And you can see throughout all of this, those green lymphatic capillaries within that bed. So it becomes quite easy to think about if you've got a high pressure within those veins, you've got an increased amount of venous pressure. So you get movement of those blood products from that capillary bed into that surrounding tissue. And that's what causes the signs and symptoms that you see every day in your clinical practice. So the three products of blood that get pushed out from that capillary bed into that interstitial tissue, is firstly plasma, and that causes the edema. There's red blood cells, which, which slowly degrade away, but leave behind the hemoglobin, the iron content, and that's why you end up with hemosiderin staining. And the final one is those white blood cells. Those white blood cells get pushed into that tissue space. They set off a chronic inflammatory reaction, which slowly and surely starts off often as venous eczema and results in an area of localised ischemia and venous ulceration. When you start thinking about venous hypertension in that way, that back pressure within the veins, the higher pressure within that capillary bed, the leaking of those blood products within that space, the penny starts to drop why we desperately need strong compression therapy. Because we need to reverse all of that pathophysiology that I've just explained. But I think that this is known. I do think that the majority of you will be working under good policies and guidelines that are informing you of this practice. But unfortunately, across the UK, we have a huge unwarranted variation in care. We have a lack of awareness that a wound on a lower leg should be classed as a leg ulcer. We have poor assessment and poor diagnosis that this is a venous leg ulcer. Some of the pathways that we use cause delay. You only need an AVPI and that can only be done in this specific service. So we're constantly time delaying by our pathways. Across the UK, there is an underuse of evidence-based practice, strong compression therapy to reduce that venous hypertension, the use of venous intervention to actually 
eliminate the problems within the veins. An overuse of ineffective therapies, light compression, reduced compression, anything less than 40 milligrams of mercury is not therapeutic for a patient with a venous leg ulcer. It's not being kind. Actually, you're elongating their care. Many of you will be working in really difficult policy restrictions. The ABPI is 1.31. You have to refer on to a different service. And also, there is variations to the approach of self-care. Some organisations are 100%. You do it yourself, off you go. We've got organisations that, that care is completely nurse-driven and nurse-led. And then we've got variations in between. The idea of us doing this session with you today is to try to eliminate some of that variations, to try to really foster a holistic approach and a unified approach to self-care. Because the reality is within our legal services across the UK, we are only healing 37% of patients after 12 months of therapy. No wonder our services are becoming swamped. No wonder the demand on us is too big for us to be able to meet. Or actually, if we standardise to evidence-based practice, I know through evidence-based that we can heal 86% of these patients at 12 weeks. And we've done that within, within 24 weeks, sorry. And we've done that within my local service. It is possible. But actually, we need to start thinking about things differently. We need to actually improve the healing rates. That is the way that we can reduce that burden, both to the NHS and to the patient who's suffering from this. And it's not just me saying this. Within the literature now, there is a decent body of evidence that's been established to say there is a real strong case for change. And the case for change is based on many different factors. We know that it saves clinical time. We know that it improves costs, direct cost savings. You have a utilisation of that wider skill mix within nursing as it is today. We have reduced recurrence rates, improved healing rates. We have an improvement of the sustainability agenda, the green agenda. And we also know that we can empower patients to take greater control so they have a, a, a better quality care and the better experience of the healthcare system. So we know that this is possible. What we need to do is start to embed it across the UK. But actually, the first steps to implementing a self-care model must be to standardise to evidence-based practice. We must ensure every single one of our patients have got access to the most effective treatment for their underlying disease. When we talk about evidence-based practice, we're talking about bringing together that pure scientific evidence, along with that patient experiential and their own desires, along with clinical experience. And actually, that's what me and Joy Tickle did many years ago now when we developed the lower limb wound pathway. And actually, if you follow that wound pathway, you will standardise to evidence-based practice. It's been updated a number of times as the evidence base has changed to bring in things like the importance of venous assessment for consideration for surgery. That's within the NICE guidance now, and we've embedded it within our local wound pathway. So your first steps to initiating self-care is make sure you have good signposting to evidence-based practice, and a way to do that is to use that type of wound pathway or some type of flow chart. But we are absolutely delighted to be here tonight to start to showcase our new best practice statement. And actually, this best practice statement is something slightly different. It's not just a collection of terms of what you should do, but this also involves a toolkit. It provides you some enablers of what can you do? How can you make that document come alive in your own clinical practice? And that document has a number of sections within it. It starts by really defining what does self-care mean? It goes on to talk about why self-care matters. And it talks about that spectrum of self-care because many people don't understand that this is a continuum. It talks about the importance of dialogue and how we can use specific dialogue tools to enable and activate our patients. And the beauty of this document 
all of that information about self-care is actually focused on that patient with a venous leg ulcer to truly help to try to make it come alive. And the first thing that best practice statement does, I think, is the thing that we desperately need. It defines what is self-care. There are many terms. I personally like the word self-supported management. Many other people like self-care. But do you know what? You can use any of these terms and it means the same thing. Patient involvement, combined care, patient-centered care. It's all a way of actually thinking about how do we put that patient in the center of their care that we are providing. So please don't worry about using one terminology and sit, stick into that alone. Any of these terminologies you can use within your clinical practice. But the definition of, of, of self-management really is embedded with, it's about increasing that individualized patient's knowledge, skills and confidence to be able to manage their own health care. And NHS England says that we can do this by putting certain interventions in place, such as peer support, self-managed education, and health coaching. If you're interested, just Google self-supported management in the NHS. There are reams of education available for you to be able to activate your patient. It's a great resource. But why I think this is really important to patients with venous leg ulceration is I think the knowledge that they have about their own condition is a true link to whether they are happy to wear full strength compression. And it's also imperative when it comes to the prevention of recurrence, because many of these patients may require lifelong compression. So we really need to educate them to the reasons why that is linking it back to that venous hypertension. But patient empowerment has so many benefits. Of course, we should be involving patients in their care. It also helps to increase their choice. It gives them a little bit of control back. It's a way that we can personalize their care to their specific needs, and you will get pay greater patient satisfaction from this. But if we know that actually the main factor is that wearing of that compression, many of you may challenge me and say, my patients are non-concordant with their compression. Well, actually, what I would say is, therefore, we need to improve patient empowerment. Because if we're able to involve them in their care, give them increased choice, make their voice of value in that relationship, I think we have better adherence to therapy that we know are effective. But self-care also has many clinicians benefit. It really gives you an opportunity to plan and coordinate your care better. So for one example, if you have a patient who's in a compression hosiery kit changing their own dressings um, and they drop a glass of red wine down their compression hosiery, if they haven't got the tools to be able to self-care, that's an immediate SOS to your out of our service. But actually, if they've got their own equipment and they've got their own empowerment, that patient can change that dressing. That is huge in terms of you being able to plan and coordinate your care. You're going to actually reduce the number of SOS visits that you're going to get. Along with that, we've proven that you can reduce direct costs. Because actually, we know you can reduce your visits and you also can reduce the number of dressing changes. Clinicians desperately want to focus with that patient. We need you, though, to actually use your really valuable skills, especially if you're a registered nurse. We need you to be actually out there with the most complex of patients, with the most difficult healthcare needs, where you're years of experience and your years of knowledge are really needed for you to make that difference. Those patients that are able to self-care, we need to encourage them so you have more time to spend with those complex patients. We also know that there's a big benefit in terms of it helps you feel better about the job you do. It helps you to deliver that compassionate, empathetic care that makes your heart sink. It makes you feel like you are doing a better job because it's reducing the burden on your time. 
it's really encouraging in this best practice statement if you start to read some of the myths and some of the truths. One of the myths we often get challenged back is that encouraging patients to self-care will make clinicians feel less redundant, less important and uncaring. Nothing has been so untrue. Self-care is not about leaving a patient on their own. It's about working with that patient, empowering and activating that patient so they are able to nurture that positive attitude towards their care. And if you think about these patients with venous hypertension, what type of patients do you think they are? They're often the patient that needs to increase their activity levels. They're often a patient who have got weight issues and often obese. They may be choosing poor lifestyle choices. So not only does patient activation help the legals side of it, you've got more chance of actually encouraging that bigger healthcare requirement of activating that patient to make better global health decisions for themselves. It really starts to think about that stronger relationship though. I have a stronger relationship with my patients that I have enacted self-care on than I do them if I'm providing that dressing change on a regular basis. The dialogue, the conversation you have with these patients change. It turns more into a conversation rather than as a clinician talking to your patient. That really starts to improve their value of the care that you are giving. Self-care is not new. It's been there as part of the NHS long-term plan back in 2019. And the NHS believes that we may need to make self-management business as usual. It needs to be in the heart of the NHS if we're going to get the NHS to survive in the next decade or two. We need the right products, the right treatments there to be able to give them confidently to patients to have the knowledge to be able to use those successfully to manage their own health care conditions. And don't forget that self supported management is embedded in so many other areas. Respiratory, they're given steroids to take and antibiotics if they have a respiratory flare up. Diabetes, we're encouraging our patients to titrate their insulin requirements depending on their sugar control. I find all those things more scary than the fact we are going to enable our patients to actually change their dressings and renew their compression. But I just want you to think about self-care differently. This is not, can you self-care, can't you self-care? It's not a black and white decision. If you look at this self-care continuum, I love this slide because it really shows you where we can think about inactivating self-care. There's only one aspect, that far right of this slide, where it's purely medical care. Major trauma centre, where a patient's unconscious, that is pure medical care. For anything less than that extreme on that right-hand side, a patient can be involved in an aspect of self-care. But what we need to do is to really think about activating that patient improving their own knowledge, skills and confidence. Because that behavioural concept of that patient activation is the heart of patient empowerment. We need to think about recognising this at the very onset of their journey within healthcare. It's not something we need to think about weeks going forward, but we need to think about that on that initial assessment. There is a great myth out there that only patients can self-care if they're fully independent. That's completely untrue. Anybody can self-care if they've been assessed as having the capability and the willingness to be involved. As clinicians, we need to be more upfront about having these open conversations about what level engagement we think is appropriate from us and how we need to activate our patients to come on this journey with us. And the one thing that's really important is you can start with baby steps, but things can change over time. We can grow this self-care, moving that patient through that continuum. The one thing, though, that self-care is not, it's not a discharge policy. So patients that self-care, off you go. And we did see a lot of that during the first wave of COVID. 
Patients that self-care, it's not true that they'll never see a clinician again. These patients still need regular clinical review. The minimum requirement of that is four to six weeks. We need that to make sure that the care plan that we're suggesting remains the most appropriate plan of care for that patient. But actually, many people will start on a much more frequent journey of that self-care, not going to that full extreme. So it's all about that initial communication. And what we want you to do is really reflect on your own clinical practice and be a little bit bold. I want you to sort of move away from that mindset of that ritualistic practice. We've always done it this way, so this is what we're going to do. By relaxing your control and trusting your patients to complete some of these tasks, their health and their well-being will be improved. So there are simple things that you can do along this journey. But it has to start from the moment of first assessment. You're all now aware of the National Wound Care Strategy's immediate and necessary care. If we actually can rule out the red flags that's associated with the National Wound Care Strategy. So if the patient has got no evidence of any acute infection on the leg or the foot, there's no evidence of sepsis, they haven't got any acute or chronic limb threatening ischemia. There's no evidence of DVT or suspected skin cancer. And the National Wound Care Strategy has added in an extra one, a sixth one, in terms of bleeding varicose veins. If you can rule out those red flags, you can safely apply up to 20 millimetres of mercury pressure at the ankle at that point in time. No pulse palpation, no Doppler needed. You are allowed to put 20 milligrams of mercury pressure on. But rather than thinking about, okay, does that mean a reduced compression bandage? Actually think about, well, can this patient self-care? Would they be more appropriate to use a compression hosiery liner or a class one British stocking at that point? To start to get into that patient's mindset that they can and should, wherever possible, be part of their care provider. But the one thing I want you to remember, if we're going to tackle those big statistics in terms of those healing rates, the one thing we need to focus on is that urgency of assessment. The National Wound Care Strategy Programme are clear. From the point of referral into your service, there is 14 days to complete that full holistic assessment, including that vascular assessment using an ABPI or a toe pressure. And I really believe in that time frame because we know the sooner we get the ulcer into evidence-based strong compression, the quicker we'll get it to heal. The longer the ulcer has been there, the more the curve flattens. In other words, for every week we go past that 14 days, we are reducing that ulcer's chance of healing within the next three months. So the urgency is complete that assessment within 14 days. Within the Atkin and Tickle pathway, we provide it in a simple algorithm do it within 14 days. The outcome is what you can see. If the ABPI is within between those normal limits of 0.8 to 1.3, that patient can safely have applied strong compression of at least 40 milligrams of mercury pressure. I slightly touched on this earlier on. There is a myth, and you the numbers of actual compression bandaging have reduced light modified nature is increasing year on year but reduced compression is not therapeutic for a venous leg ulcer it will not impact on that venous hypertension it will not change that chronic inflammatory state within that capillary bed like we need it to some clinicians still have this will start with reduced compression and will step them up after time that is not the best evidence care so long as we have an adequate arterial supply, that patient needs to be provided with strong of at least 40 millimetres of mercury pressure as soon as possible. If you want to change one thing in your practice, for me, I'd be binning my reduced compression for these patients. Because we have data from Julian guests to say that actually, for a large proportion of those patients who are suitable for strong compression, 
they are being sold light reduced compression, subtherapeutic compression. It's like having one paracetamol for a headache. It's not going to make a difference. So I just want you to reflect and be bold. How do you approach this with your patient? Do you have a full positive attitude about compression therapy? Think about the language you use. Don't call it a tie bandage. Call it a squeezing bandage. Talk about that chronic inflammation and how this is a potent anti-inflammatory device to help that pain. Think about the analgesia requirement as needed. Ask your patients to say, please wear this system and I promise you your pain will be better in two weeks. The pain that they're getting is because the nerve endings within that capillary bed are bathed within cytokines. The cytokines are part of the inflammatory response. You bed down that inflammation, their pain will improve. And please, please don't see compression as a harmful device. I know many of you will have been taught the rhetoric of be careful of the harm from compression. The chance of you harming a patient with compression is really small indeed. But actually many patients are being harmed every day within the NHS due to lack of therapeutic levels of compression. So please just change your mindset. Think about where you're coming from. I just want to let you know of a, of a new piece of work that's going to be coming out from an international body. There's a new consensus document that's going to come out for mixed disease ulceration. For, so for those patients with mild to moderate peripheral arterial disease, along with an element of venous disease, they are saying that we can use up to 40 milligrams of mercury pressure on that group of patients, even if they've got an ABPI down to 0.51. The mindset is changing within this space. Watch out for that document. It should be here sometime towards the beginning of next year. But hopefully that just sort of makes you understand why we're changing. Because actually we know compression is so powerful. We need to be putting that on as many patients as we can. Because the harm of the absence of compression is greater than the perceived harm that we're currently working under in terms of its damaging. You can see from this slide of the power of compression, that change in that patient happened within two weeks of compression therapy. They were admitted with an acute infection of cellulitis. They developed that superficial ulceration on the back of the leg, high volumes of exudate, brand new wound, straight into full strength compression. Within two weeks, that leg is perfectly healed. And the reason for that is you've broken that potent anti-inflammatory cycle. You've set it back you've allowed that edema to start to resolve. We have high level of evidence for compression therapy. Many randomized control trials, systematic reviews, meta-analysis, the one thing that makes a difference to a patient with venous leg ulceration is strong compression. And in today's world, we have a huge variety of options for us. Compression hosiery kits, which we know provides that 40 milligrams of mercury at the ankle, multi-layer bandage systems, two layers and four layers, compression wraps devices for the leg, for the foot, toe caps to be able to use on that interdigital. We have loads of options available. On top of that, we have an abundance these days of fantastic aids to aid the application for patients if they've got issues with dexterity or they can't touch their toes. And compression therapy itself has been proven to, to help patients' symptoms, and it has an impact directly on their quality of life. So we need to get this strong, amazing therapy available to more of our patients. So if I talk about compression therapy and I start to talk about self-care solutions, I'm really talking in a way about compression bandaging versus compression hosiery kits or compression wrap systems because a patient will never be allowed, will never be able to put on their compression bandage. Try putting one on yourself to be able to get the right pressures is virtually impossible. So actually, if you're gonna have a compression bandage, you're gonna need a healthcare practitioner to be able to apply that. There are a certain group of patients who are not suitable for self-care solutions. Their limb or their wound is not suitable for a compression wrap or a compression hosiery kit. So they need a period of bandaging. 
the Atkin and Tickle algorithm works you through this. It signposts you to what you need. Because if you've got patients like on those slides with high volumes of exudate that you know is not going to be contained within a dressing, or you've got significant um, limb distortion with that soft, reducible edema, both of those patients are going to require a, a period of compression bandaging to be able to reshape that leg. And the pathway clearly signposts to where that's needed. But it also allows you to use self-care solutions straight away where appropriate. So if the exudate is within the dressing, there's very little limb distortion, we can think about using compression hosiery kits and compression wrap systems for these patients from the start of their journey. So both of these patients that you see within these pictures are suitable for compression hosiery kits or compression wrap systems. You might say that you might think this as being a bit of a, a second class option. I just want you to reflect for one second. If you had a venous leg ulcer, would you really want a bandage on that you cannot remove, you cannot have a shower, you cannot put your own footwear in and you are 100% reliant on that healthcare practitioner calling into your house or making you an outpatient appointment or a clinic appointment. Is that really what you'd want? Because I, if I was a patient, I would much prefer my own empowerment. I would like to be able to change my dressings when I want to, have a shower when I want to, strip my whole dressing off and actually shower the wound down because I want to feel cleaner. To be able to change that dressing because I'm going out to see my auntie tomorrow, so I'm going to change my dressing tonight. To be able to readjust that compression so if your bandage is slipping, you've got no choice but to wait until you see your healthcare practitioner. If your compression rat starts to slip slightly or your compression stocking, you can readjust that. There are so many advantages to that patient being empowered to be able to look after their own compression. And the beauty of the compression uh, solutions that are provided by LNR, the sponsor of this session, is that they are evidence-based for both of these things continue to grow. The compression hosiery kit provides that perfect 40 milligrams of mercury compression at the ankle. It's very easy to size, the calf measurement and ankle measurement. There's two types of hosiery kit, the Activa hosiery kit, which is designed for patients without edema, and the Actilymph hosiery kit, which is designed for patients with edema. It's got a slightly stiffer fabric, if you like, to be able to control the edema. Compression hosiery kits have high level of evidence through the venous force study that they are as effective as a multi-layer bandage. You can call those gold standard too. The compression wrap system, LNR now has evidence to say that that compression wrap system provides sustained compression of around 40 to 60 milligrams of mercury. Don't be worried thinking 60 is too high, it's not. We need them to have at least 40. In Europe, they're using 60, 70. That pressure measurement of that 40 to 60 is perfect for the reduction of that venous hypertension. We also know because of the fabric that there is an, a stiffer fabric within that wrap. So we know it's extremely good at managing that edema and pushing that fluid back into the lymphatics. They're easy to apply and the evidence base, the empirical evidence base for, for the compression wrap system is growing year on year. And hopefully by this time next year, we'll have the results of Venus 6. Some of the pushbacks, though, that I often get, especially for the compression wraps, is that they're expensive. I just want you to have a look at this slide for a moment or two. So let's say you're going to be in compression bandaging for a week. The numbers are very similar for the compression wraps, but actually you're probably not going to be in it just for eight weeks, are you? You're going to be in it a lot longer than that. At 16 weeks, it becomes more cost effective than a compression bandage. At 24 weeks, it's probably nearly a quarter of the cost of that compression bandage. So please don't think about that unit cost in isolation. It's about the cost of this journey towards healing. And actually, how much is the elimination of the recurrence to you in the NHS? 
So if you are able to get a patient into a compression wrap early on in their journey, they see their edema reducing, they will be willing to carry on with that therapy on a long-term basis. They're much more likely to wear that for the rest of their days to control their edema. You've eliminated or reduced their risk substantially of the risk of recurrence. How much money have you saved the NHS by doing that? I love this slide because I'm a great visual person. Obviously, there are some pros and cons to each of these systems. And as you can see here, we need to be choosing bandages in certain places, especially where we need limb volume reduction, where we've got abnormal shaping, where we've got deep skin folds. But actually, we can be using hosiery kits and compression wrap systems in similar places. But just remember that if you've got high volumes of edema, we need something that's going to be able to push that back. Once we've eliminated the edema, we need a stiff enough garment or a wrap to keep that edema from reoccurring. So hopefully I've given you the tools in terms of the compression solutions that you've got that you can use within this patient group to support their independent management of their leg ulcer. But I just want to spend the last few minutes thinking about how you can start to deliver self-care on your patients. And there's three things I just want you to think about. I want you to think about planning it. I want you to get comfortable with the dialogue and some of the terminologies so you can have this conversation with your patients and feel comfortable and empowered about it. I want you to think about the activities that they can do. It might not be applying compression. It might be something else. And actually, what resources have you got available to back up those conversations so that patient can continue to grow their journey? I love this slide from NHS uh, uh, Health Education England, because when they talk about health coaching and that planning stage, they say that the person already has within them everything they need to be able to navigate through a problem and find a solution that's most relevant to them. They already have it. All we need to do is enable it within that patient. And you can do that enablement by having those initial conversations. Think about having that positive approach. Obviously, be understanding and empathetic, but be helpful. Think about having that environment to where oh, asking those appropriate questions. What are your goals for your health? What are you wanting to get back to doing? It's about thinking about changing that environment from, well, can you do your dressing next week because we're understaffed and we've got no time, to thinking about, actually, is this of use to you? Are we enabling you? Are we growing you as a person? Are we thinking about your overall health? And actually, communication is the key to this. I often think as nurses we should have regular education on communication because it's something we learn when we're in training and we never get educated on it again. Think about the tone you use when you're talking to your patients. It's really difficult to get that tone that's a perfect set. You don't want to come across as patronising but you certainly want to come as, across as caring. Think about that two-way conversation. It's not about you just telling them, it's you of active listening. Welcome their views because you want them to feel like they're valued in terms of your decision making. Watch your body language. The one thing I'd say is eye contact. Don't be listening at the same time as writing. You need to be looking at that person's face. If you had a patient who's new to venous leg ulceration, giving them all that information and all of that how to care for your own wound and all of that how to apply this compression wrap, might be very daunting because there's a lot of information. You don't have to do it all at once. You can break it down into sections. Try not to overwhelm them with your ask. Use open questions so actually they have an opportunity to really think about that and give you that clear answer. Use language that's free from judgment, that actually is inclusive and really think about the words you use to make sure that patient is in the centre of every part of your decision making. We need to be collaborating with that wider team that's around that patient, their carers, their family members, to try to make this a shared decision rather than an isolated decision. So 
if I ask you about self-care, you might instantly think, can that patient put on their own hosiery? Can they do their own wound care? But you don't have to be that. I want you to think about with your patient, what aspects of self-care can that patient be engaged in now? Because any of these activities is a small part, but it starts to encourage the patient to ease themselves into that self-care routine. You can build on that over time. Simply taking a photo, stripping off the dressings, helping to emoliate their own leg, thinking about how they move their foot into the position that you want it to be. Maybe even taking a photo describing to you what they can see on the wound rather than you describing it back to them, undertaking their own cleansing, their own debridement of that surrounding debris to really think about if it's painful, isn't it better for them to cleanse their own wound than you? They know when it hurts, they know how much pressure they want and you can encourage them to take, undertake any of these activities. So it's not just simply, can they change their own dressings? Can they apply their compression systems? It's about working with them. And this fantastic new practice statement is a real resource for you. I've only given you a few of the tools that's within this document. I urge you all to download or click on or take a photograph of that QR code. I'm not down with the kids. I'm not very good at technology. But that takes you a direct link to that document and have a look at what's in there, especially the dialogue tools about words and phrases you should be using with your patients and one that's best to avoid. Look as well within the LNR website, there is a whole mini series on self-care, which is really valuable to you. So I just want you tonight before you go to bed, just ensure that you as an individual are providing the best possible care you can. And to do that, just focus on the urgency of getting it right first time. That focus on the accurate diagnosis is this venous ulceration. We want you to ensure that you are using evidence-based practice throughout. How are you gonna embed that into your own practice and your wider service practice? Using something like the Lowell and Wound Pathway will ensure that. Think about how are you going to use self-care solutions in the patients you might be seeing tomorrow and the patients you'll be seeing in the weeks to come. How do you activate your patients? What's their trigger? What's the right terminology to be able to start to speak to them? Doing all of that will ensure you're providing the right care at the right time. It will help to reduce the NHS burden by actually healing these patients and it will provide you a little bit more time back to care. So just finally consider, how are you going to standardise practice across your whole healthcare setting? Because that's the biggest way we're going to actually help to break this global crisis. I've hoped you've found that informative. I hope I've given you some nuggets of inspiration and some tools to be able to do something different. Many of you out there will be working in challenging environments and many of you actually uh, will be in a situation where it's becoming slightly negative. I love this phrase from Legs Matters. Just stop the complicit failure. Be the change you want to see. Your behaviours, how you approach this, will start to stop that complicit failure. Thank you very much for listening, and I welcome any questions. Thank you, Leanne. That's uh, brilliant, as always. Um, we've uh, don't forget we've also got our uh, there's a Facebook group that actually we set up with Eleanor about three years ago, believe it or not. Now that has I think it's around about two and a half thousand members, um, and the you can find it on our JCN um, homepage on the on our JCN Facebook page. Um, I've asked my colleagues to just put the link to that up now. So if you're not a member of that group, that's the uh, clinical leadership in um, offer. Lower leg self care, so clinical leadership for lower leg self self care, um, and that group is a is a group where basically people share best practice with each other. It's where people ask questions. Leanne, I know you're an active member of that group. Oh, I um, love it. This week we've been talking about ulcers on a malleolus and whether it's a pressure ulcer or a leg ulcer. The debates we get into, the snippets that I learn from that site is fantastic. I really urge you all. 
there is a whole wealth of experience, some very clever people and some people that hardly ever sees a wound. And it's a lovely welcoming community within that group. Yeah, absolutely. So do click on the link and, uh, and and join that group. We do post quite a lot of links to, um, so you'll get links to things like the best practice statement and things like this that we talked about tonight. They also go into that group. So uh, go in and join. Uh, you can ask as many questions as you like in there as well. And uh, I think the key that, that, that you know, the what we try to uh, nurture in terms of that group is, an, is, a, is a safe space where people don't need to be embarrassed. Um, if you've got a complex case or something like that, you want to ask people, you can do that in that group. So uh, we look forward to seeing you there. Um, Leanne, I'm conscious about the, uh, the, the the time as always, because uh, uh, it's you forget about time when you're listening to you because you're so easy to listen to. But we've had loads of questions come through, so I'm going to get cracking with those. Um, the first is uh, uh, some of my patients just don't want to wear compression garments um, or understand the importance of compression. How do I or my team overcome this? Well, in a way, I'd challenge you to say that probably the healthcare system failed their patients really early on. So if that patient had gross amount of edema and were putting on a compression bandage that kept slipping down, that kept being uncomfortable, that didn't do the therapy that it wanted to do, I wore it for six weeks and it's made no difference to my leg. And actually, you broke the confidence within that patient. And I think a lot of the things that we're trying to unpick with those patients that are challenging to wear compression therapies is actually their past experiences. So it's about breaking it right down to the very beginning to explain to that patient why compression is needed, giving them a range of options. Some options are more comfortable than others. And flat knit garments for edema are much more comfortable to wear than elastic there are a huge amount of compression garments on the market. Have you got the right one for that patient? And we need a wide range of patient choice. If you think about where we all buy our tights from to go to work, multiple different shops, we wouldn't want just to be stuck to one manufacturer for that. So it's about actually giving that patient a range of different solutions to be able to say which one. And it's about slowly but chipping away of that. Have a look at the, the resources on the NHS England. Uh, there's some great ones in terms of how to manage those uh, those patients that have got challenges in terms of coming along that path with you. Yeah. About how you activate that patient. There's some real um, important people there. I'm not saying I've got nobody that don't wear their compression, but actually a lot of patients we get referred as non-concordant. They actually go away wearing good compression. So there's something about the dialogue, there's something about the right garment, and there's something about that trust and that confidence in that practitioner. But just yeah, unpick so where that belief that came from. Okay, find something that um, find something that works for that patient, which is what you said is that there will be something out there. Um, okay, so why are we seeing such an increase in wounds? Is it less mobility, higher coma, or higher comorbidity, both? The state of the nation and COVID didn't help. Um, it, Inactivity um, is number one, along with obesity is number two. And then also people are living longer. And yeah, so you've got more chance of developing a, a disease. And um, it is just the state of the nation, I would say. Um, and that's for many of the other diseases that we're seeing increasing. Diabetes, diabetic foot infection, all of these come down to really three things. Weight, diet, exercise. If we could tackle those things within our patients, actually, most cardiovascular and other diseases would disappear. Um, but I'm not too sure how we do that. Okay, we won't ask you to uh, fix the NHS completely tonight. Uh, okay, next question is, uh, how often do you see your self-care patients in clinic to evaluate progression or deterioration? I think you yeah. answered this earlier. Complete, but we just well, it completely, dep completely depends on the patient. So I've had, I'll tell you two examples. I've seen a lady this week who had orif of her ankle. She got a dehist surgical wound. It's gone down to just above that surgical plate. Um, but obviously, because she's got an orif of ankle, she's got significant amount of edema. Um, I'm really worried about the depth of that wound, but she is doing her own self-care by certain dressings, certain um, foam dressings over the top of that primary dressing. And then I've put her in an active impose kit to be able to really focus on that edema. 
she's changing her dressing every day and I'm seeing her back in one week from now. I've got another patient who I've seen today who has been in a compression a leg um, ready wrap uh, for the last four weeks. I didn't see them until four weeks ago. They've been doing all of their own care in that four weeks with no problems whatsoever. And I've seen them today, which is a four week time spot. So it's anything from, in my world, weekly um, to four weekly. Um, and it just depends on your severity, your complexity of needs and where you are in your self-care journey. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question, how do we find out who is commissioned to provide Doppler services in order to promote quick and appropriate compression application? Oh, this is a really interesting question, is this? Um, everybody who is doing wound management should be able to undertake a Doppler. And I say that, and I know many of this audience will go, you are. It's a blood pressure. It's a blood pressure. That's all it is. It's basic training. We need to stop thinking about who's commissioned to do it, who's responsible to do it, which service should be providing it. This is a baseline test. Unfortunately, it's the key to the door for compression therapy within the UK. We need to enable that the patient's got that key from the door right at the very beginning. So I would urge you, if you are dealing with patients with lower limb ulceration, start doing Dopplers. It's not a big skill. We have our healthcare support workers doing Dopplers within Wakefield Community Trust. Okay, but I mean, in, 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 uh, I, I agree that everybody obviously should be able to do it, but um, the, the, with, with regards to the question, who is commissioned to do it, I guess that's in ind each individual trust. You, you need to go and speak to whoever is running your leg ulcer service, whether that's a tissue mobility team or whether it's somebody in the vascular team. Yeah, because... your, your commissioning policies will be very, very different from where you are. Um, it might be practice nurse, might be community nursing staff, it might be adult community nursing, it might be specific clinics. Uh, we call ourselves the National Health Service, but we are nothing about being a national yeah. service. It's a postcode lottery of where you land. Yeah, because I'm taking a guess here, but it sounds like as if the person who's asked that question probably doesn't do it themselves. But that's uh, maybe they can maybe they can let us know. Um, so we've got time for another one or two questions. Another one here is: uh, Do nurses need specific training on compression therapy before they can carry this out? Um, so that, before, that's yeah, the difficulty. Yeah. So I think everybody should have um, a specific training on the assessment and diagnosis how to do an ABPI, how to recognize venous disease, how to distinguish arterial and venous disease. But let's say somebody's done that and somebody said, this patient's got a venous leg ulcer, they need full strength compression. The difficulty with compression bandaging is you do need specific training and you probably need training on that specific product that you're using in your organization. And what's really challenging is maintaining those competencies. So if you're a practice nurse, you might see a venous leg ulcer, you might see three, then you might not see any for six months and you might feel uncomfortable with it. The beauty of the compression hosiery kits and the compression wrap systems, they need no formal training. Anybody can pick up one of those and use them. The for both of them, I'd urge you just to watch a YouTube video, especially the wraps because of which way they go. But it's minimal education. If you read the leaflet in the packet, you can apply both of those systems. And I think that's a huge advantage because it widens the workforce of who can do that. Yeah, and it's probably worth saying as well, just with specifically with relation to uh, to L &R, who are sponsoring this evening session, is that they've got a really they've got a really big and actually well established, well experienced team. So there'll always be somebody, um, you know, very close to you. So you can contact L and R, and they'll, that you know, that I, I'm I'm fairly confident to say this that they would arrange a meeting with you, or, you know, a breakfast meeting or a lunch meeting, or come out to you and do some one on one training with yourself and and your team. So uh, so bear that in mind. And on top of that, Alec, I often ring my clinical advisor from LNR to ask specific questions. They are I've got a wealth of knowledge in certain solutions. So, you know, they're there for you if you're on the start of this journey. If you have a very complex patient and you don't know what's the best garment to get them or the best device to get them, they are fantastic at being able to give you that support with that most complex of patient. And I use them still on a regular basis. Good. You could even come to one of our journal community nursing events. We were in uh, we were in Durham today, so keep an eye on our website, find out where we are, because L and R are one of our 
uh, one of our sponsors and um, they come and they talk about uh, they come about uh, talk about these things in person at our event so we'll be in uh, Cardiff coming up and then Durham and Norwich uh, before the end of the year so you can register to attend uh, face-to-face training on one of, uh, one of those um, that's the end of the uh, Q&A there are plenty of questions that we didn't get through but as always we'll take a look at those and uh, and reply to them uh, put them onto our website You'll be able to get a copy of this uh, presentation um, along with uh, the video on our website within the next couple of days. And if you missed the beginning, or if there's a particular part that you want to go back to, this will now be uh, this will now be available on our on our Facebook page. You'll be able to watch that at um, at any time that you like. Um, I'm one of my colleagues will put a link up for your certificates. What I'm going to say now is um, when you download your certificate. There is an option on there which says that, uh, would you like to be contacted? Uh, I'm not sure what it says to be contacted for, but if you click on that, then what we'll make sure is that we include links to things like the Facebook group and any documents and that QR code, because I'm conscious that that just flashed up quite quickly. Um, we'll we'll include that as we uh, in the email that we send you your certificate in. Um, my technical team are in the background now saying, we can't do that, give us a moment, but um, I'm sure we can work it out. Um, so listen, Leanne, thank you very, very much again for a wonderful presentation and uh, to all of our um, friends and colleagues over at LNR, thank you very much again for, uh, for, for supporting this. You can see by the comments, if you've been watching that it's, uh, it's a subject that, um, that everybody is very, very interested in. Uh, finally, thanks to my team and the team over at Mold Digital for putting on the event. Uh, thank you very much. We look forward to meeting you or seeing you at, uh, at, at our next event, either face to face or here on uh, here on Facebook. Um, and uh, I think that's it. Have I missed anything, Leanne? It's been a while since I've done one of these. It's been a while since we've done one together. No, I think that's it. I think. I think so. Just thank you all for giving up your evening to come and join us. It is much appreciated. And just carry on being amazing out there. That's a very good way to end. So uh, thank you very much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your evening and uh, we look forward to catching up with you soon.